In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst. So the question is, why are you here? Why are you here and not somewhere else? And that question was, was brought up to me this week in talking with someone about the understanding of the worship of Christ and why are we in the church? Why can't we do whatever we want to do wherever we want to? Why do we have to come here? And what is the important part of, of our presence here and also our, uh, also our participation here? You know, as people come in uh, today, have them just come in and sit down during the sermon. It's okay. Come in and sit down so you're not in the outer darkness. That's a biblical slip in there. I don't know if you got that. So what I wanted to read to you is a couple parts of the Gospels. First is Mark chapter 15, which is on page 129 in your Orthodox study Bible. It's in front of you. You By the time you find it, I'll already be through it. So it says, later he appeared. Well, let let me rewind a little bit here. So it says, the risen Christ appears. Now, when he rose on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. So she went and told the disciples. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Then we have the Great Commission, which is uh, the kind of the ordination or the calling to um, the apostles. And it says, Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. He rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. So there, there's something that was said there and alluded to there that you know, we could just skip over when we read that. And it says, Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. At, as they sat at the table, what does that mean? sat at the table meant that they were celebrating the Eucharist. So they had gathered together to celebrate, to commemorate Christ. As he said, do this in remembrance of me. They were doing it. They remembered him, but they didn't believe that he rose from the dead. And then as they sat at the table and he rebuked them or yelled at them at their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. So now there's a couple things there. First is the Understanding that now we have the, the disciples who are gathering together, they're celebrating, they're drinking the wine, they're eating the bread, knowing that Christ has called for this to happen. And they don't believe that he rose. They still think he's dead. So let's move ahead here to the Gospel of John, which is in chapter 20, verse 19. The same day at that evening, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut for the disi- where the disciples were assembled, assembled is another word for gathered together for prayer or Eucharist, they had the doors locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus appears in the midst of them. With the doors locked, he appears. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be to you as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And then we know the story that follows after that is Thomas. Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with them. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger in the print of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside. Inside where? Worshiping. Keeping the Sabbath, right? Eucharist. And Thomas was with them, and Jesus came again, the doors being shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he turned to Thomas and said, Now, Place your fingers on my side. So we, we see that there's a couple things here that sometimes when, when people ask, what, what, is, what is church about and why do we have to be in church? Why do we have to pray? What, what is it about? Is it for the priest? Is it for the, the stewardship? No, it's about what Christ calls us to do, to come together to celebrate and to remember him, the great remembrance.
the Eucharist, the Thanksgiving, the great Thanksgiving, to come together in prayer and to, um, you could tell them to come in and sit down when they're done. Um, to come together in prayer, to thank God, and to receive what? The Eucharist. Now, many times in our church, we, we think that um, we can establish that connection outside of, outside of the church. We can do it wherever we want. We can, we can sit you know, in our car and, and put icons up and burn incense or do whatever, and all of a sudden, we're going to have that connection with God. Well, there's a couple things that Christ says that are important. Um, everything he says is important, but a couple things that are important to understanding the, where we need to be. And he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood and receive the Eucharist, I don't abide in you, you don't abide in me. And unless you come together in prayer, where two or three are gathered, there I am also. So he gives those commands. He says that if you come together in prayer, I'm there. And he shows that. And you know, sometimes we think, well, how does, how does Christ show that? Well, he shows that when he rose from the dead because the doors were locked. And then what? He appears in their midst. And he, the second time he does that, he zooms in on Thomas and says, come here, Thomas, I know you don't believe. He already yelled at the 11 the week before, right? And says, I can't believe that none of you, you're coming together, you're, you're eating this bread and drinking this wine, remembering me, and you don't believe? And the women who came to my tomb when you didn't come to my tomb he told you that I rose and you still don't believe. I mean, can you imagine how frustrating that was for Christ to say that? And so he sees Thomas after the 11, his brothers um, that were there. Were, he, he tells the 11, you know what, um, or at that point it was 10, so I should probably knock one off because Judas wasn't there. So he tells them, he says, your brother saw me last week. I mean, come here, put your finger in here if you don't believe it. Feel my sides, feel my hands. And we see that Christ appears and is in the midst of his disciples and apostles in prayer. That's why we say Christ is in our midst, right? We don't say that as a, as a hokey catchphrase like, uh, you know, whatever. It's Christ is in our midst because he is in our midst. And it's a reminder that he was, he is now, and he always will be. In our midst, not in my midst, in our midst. And that our midst, in our presence, is, is understanding that it's where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is also. But now if we look at the early church, we might say, well, it was just the disciples that were there. Well, now I want you to pick up your book. Okay, So if you have one, you should have one. I think we ordered 120 for the church, so every slot should have one. And I want you to go to page 819. And you're probably going to crack the spine on the Bible when you open it that, because it probably hasn't been opened that far. And it should say the 70. Just like this. The 70, right? What does that mean, the 70? Well, that means these are names. If you have an Orthodox study Bible at home, look at these names. Now, these are the 70 that we're following Christ in addition to the 12. So there's 82 following Christ and the Virgin Mary, but I don't think she's listed in here as that, and neither is Matthias. He should not be listed in here either, who was the one who replaced Judas. So there's actually probably 69 in here uh, because Matthias replaces Judas, and he was one of the 70. So now if you think of them getting together and locking themselves in, we're talking some, anywhere between 11 or 12 up into 82 people that are coming together to receive the Eucharist, to come together in prayer. So what does this say for us? This says this is the establishment of the church. Christ himself establishes the method by which we are supposed to come together. Not optional, not up to our own will or our own decisions. This is what he sets up. So if we don't like it, then we don't like what Christ himself set up. So we have to understand that it was a, day, a daily commemoration of the Eucharist, but it was also something that on the Sabbath you had to commemorate the Eucharist. You had to. Because there is no Sabbath without the Eucharist. That's why every Sunday, every church, everywhere, 
you will see the service of either mass or uh, the divine liturgy, mass in the Western church, although it's not quite the same, you know, and there's other faiths that get together, but some of the other faiths that get together don't even celebrate the Eucharist. I mean, what a shame that is. Because then again, it's, it's looking at what, what Christ put together and saying, you know what, we'll make it optional. We'll do it once a year. Or we don't do that. Or we'll make it grape juice because if Jesus had grape juice, he would have chosen the Welch's instead of the wine. Or whatever the case is. We, people make ideas all over the place. We don't have the latitude to do that. We are called to come together in prayer. We are called to, to receive the Eucharist. And where there are two or three gathered, Christ comes through even the locked doors, even the locked doors of our hearts. He appears inside and is there to transform and to make us new and make us whole. So the understanding of church and why you're here, and, and even the service, I think sometimes we, we go through the, our life as Orthodox and we don't really understand, well, what, what are we doing? Or what, why, is it, why is the service the way it is? Why is it ancient? Why is it... Um, you know, why do we wear these vestments? And why, why don't we just come up here with a t-shirt and pants? And why am I not facing you? And all these things. And all these little um, details of the church that we might not understand. And that's the call for us, if we don't understand those things, to learn about them. To come, we're going to have a, a Bible study uh, once a month. We're going to have Orthodoxy 101, uh, which will go through the A to Zs on on uh, Christian, Orthodox Christianity. And if you know all these things, wonderful. If you don't know them, you're still responsible for them. You know, that, that was one of the things that one of my professors said. He said, um, are you an Orthodox Christian? I said, and everybody, you know, every, he was really pounding down the class. He was a great professor. And he would say, you're an Orthodox Christian, right? And he'd say, yep. He says, you have a cross around your neck? Yep. Um, have you read the Bible? And people are like, nope. Um, hey, do you know what's in the Bible? Nope. I mean, we know some of it. And he's like, you know what's going to happen to you? This is what he would say. And he was telling seminarians and, and now priests, what's going to happen to you is if you don't know it, you're going to be responsible for it. Because it's not up to you to decide that you don't want to know it. That you don't want to learn it. So what I'm saying to you is I'm passing that message to you too that you have to know these things and learn why am I here. Because if you learn why you're here, then when you're here, you will be transformed by the presence of, of Christ himself. That he will come to you personally, as a whole and individually. He will come to us and transform us and make us something extraordinary. Not the people who we were on the outside, but the people that were called to be in the presence of God. So if anyone asks you ever, why do you go to church? You don't have to say, because... That's what we're supposed to do, uh, otherwise the priest gets mad, or if I don't go, I, you know, or whatever the thing is. We go to church and, and we celebrate the divine liturgy because Christ has established it. Period. That's your answer. That's what Christ has established. Why do we do what we do? Because Christ has established it. Not mankind, it's not a formulation of man, it's an expression and an articulation and a a definitive path in the calling of Christ to say, come worship me. So it's not about worshiping the priest. That's why the priest does not face you because it's not about worshiping me or me worshiping you. We're all praying together to who? To God. That's what it's about. And the priest is supposed to be the guide and the leader to, to open up and to guide, to spiritually guide uh, the, the parish and the people in the path of salvation, in their own path of salvation, which is found in the context of the church. Now, when we look at the Eucharist, when Holy Communion, it's something that uh, there's, there's such a varying spectrum from people that come every Sunday to people who don't come at all, or they come once every blue moon. So what is the proper way of doing it? The proper way in the old church was if you missed communion three times in a row, you were out. You were excommunicated. Why? Because they said, you're missing. What happened? Are you worshiping the idols and you don't believe in Christ? I mean, if somebody, and you know, you know I know your names when you come up for communion, right? I mean, nobody's a secret. I mean, I might get mixed up twins and stuff like that, but I pretty much know who you are when you come up. 
And I know who doesn't come up when I give out the bread at the end, unless you leave and, and do yourself the disservice of leaving midstream in the liturgy. But what's the, the whole thing was, what if I came up to you, at, like in the early church, what they did, and said, are you worshiping idols? Why didn't you receive communion today? You'd be like, oh, uh, I, I ate, you know, a burger on Friday, or I, I beat up my husband, or I don't know what it is. But what if you were cornered like that every single time you missed Holy Communion? Then you would say, uh, you'd probably disappear from the church because you wouldn't want to be prodded. But the other thing would be that you would get a foretaste of what Christ is going to ask us too. You know, the uncomfortable questions that the priest might ask you, or when I see you, when I preach sometimes, and I see you squirm in your pews, that's the same thing that Christ is going to do to us at the end. So get used to it. Because he's going to put the screws to us and, and, and say, okay, what did you, I know what you did. Do you see what you did? And open us up and say, I see that in there. Now do you see it? And pull it out and say, here, look, this is what you've done. And if we deny it, then he's going to say, you're lying to yourself. So old school, orthodox, if you want to call it that, I'll receive major feast days and those things. True school of orthodox is every Sunday, every time liturgy is offered. You know, the priest can be defrocked, have his priesthood removed. If he goes to a parish on a Sunday or a liturgy and does not receive Holy Communion, and if the bishop finds out about that and says, why didn't you receive Holy Communion? Were you not prepared? Were you not prepared to celebrate the, the, the Eucharist? What were you doing? Aren't we supposed to all be in a constant state of preparation? So we come together to celebrate the Eucharist. This is not a, a bystander event. It's not something where we just sit down and say, well, I'll just watch and hopefully something will stick to me and you know, by, uh, by the pores of my skin I'll be ab absorb something that will change my life. We have to make the proactive stance and say, I'm going to prepare to receive the sacrament, which is the pinnacle of the Divine Liturgy. That's why the Divine Liturgy ends minutes later after the reception of Holy Communion. That's it. That is, everything's leading up to that, to defining God in the petitions that we say, to articulating who we're praying for, asking for forgiveness, reading, learning, preaching, hearing the Word of God explained to us, and climbing this, this liturgical ladder to the point where we get to the consecration of the gifts, where the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ, to the reception of those gifts. And then what? The departure. Then you leave. Let us depart in peace. And then what does it say? Let us pray to the Lord, right? We depart in peace. We go about our ways filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the divine um, presence of God in ourselves. But it doesn't mean that just because communion is offered that it's you come up. There's times when people come for confession they do things wrong and they're not supposed to come for communion. There's other things that, that um, the lack of preparedness is also reflected in the prayers that we read for Holy Communion. Do not burn me as, as the unworthy one. Don't we read that in the prayers? You are a fire which consumes the unworthy. Uh, how shall I who am unworthy enter into the splendor of your saints? For I, if I dare to enter into the bridal chamber, my clothing will accuse me since it is not a wedding garment. It's not white. I'm tarnished by sin. And we pray for forgiveness. But we have to prepare ourselves and do our part and then come to Christ as the sinful woman does and comes to his feet and uses her tears to wash the feet of Christ and say, I, I, I'm here. I'm, I'm penitent. I'm, I'm asking for forgiveness. I'm asking for God's mercy. And then what does Christ do? He looks down at the woman and says, you have done a beautiful thing by coming here. And then what did you hear in the background? You hear Judas saying, hey, we should have sold that, that stuff and, and got the money and given it to the poor. And, it's not, and then the gospel says it's not because he was concerned, but because he used to steal. So we have to do our part and we have to be active participants in the liturgy. We have to pray, we have to ask God for forgiveness, and we have to know why we're here so that we can experience the presence of God. And as St. Gregory of Palamas says in his, his uh, discourse on energy and essence of God, 
He says you can know who God is through his energies. You will never know what makes God God, which is his essence. But you can also experience and appreciate what God is by creation, right? You look around, you see a tree, you see grass, you see flowers, and you say, those are beautiful. That's God, God made those things. But you cannot have communion with those things. You cannot come into communion with God by just going out and standing in front of a tree and holding it and saying, God made this and God loves me and I'm going to be saved. No, we have to come into a relationship with Christ. Where does Christ appear? In the midst of the locked doors of the church, the locked doors of our hearts, and most of all, in the context of the Divine Liturgy. Amen.